Andrew Congdon here, corresponding for Sometimes Daily in beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm here in front of Jetstream Wind Incorporated, a company dedicated to saving the world through alternative energy. CEO Henry Herman. Henry, thanks for having us. No problem. Pleasure to meet you. So tell us a little bit about how Jetstream Wind got its start. Jetstream was incorporated on February 22nd, 2008. It was kind of a, a synergy of people that wanted to come together and create a, a new type of renewable energy that was firm dispatchable power. Wind is up and down all day long. Solar panels are high energy producing at noon but low in the morning and evening. So we wanted to create a situation that was more applicable to sell wholesale power to utility companies and therefore lowering prices to their consumers. One of the things we wanted to show is that there's really no need to sacrifice with renewable energy. You can create a format that is consistent, stable, and can create the, the security we're used to with other types of power. Do you have other things in the works? We have quite a few things in the works. Uh, this is basically just a stepping stone. We wanted to start with utility scale power. There are a lot of companies out there that are providing solar panels for homes, that are trying to do larger scale for commercial buildings. We found that if we were a little more aggressive um, and started on a power plant level, on the megawatt scale, then everything else would probably be quite a bit easier. We're providing the same type of energy as a natural gas-fired plant, same format, you're burning a gas, but we don't pay for that gas, it's free. Why will you succeed where others have failed? The economies of scale come into play a great deal. Um, if you start off small, it will take you a longer time to gain a foothold in the industry. But if you approach markets where you can start off at a much higher level, um, you tend to acclimate a little better financially, um, give a higher return on investment to your investors, and you get a little bit more creative because there's a little bit more pressure on you. You're not just trying to make the month-to-month -month bills, you're really trying to stay ahead of the giants in the industry. And one of the ways we did that was to start off creating mobile usage for hydrogen as well. Let's take a look. Got it. Basically, this is our prototype um, for the New Mexico film industry. It's called the Climate Kitchen. We had interest from the movie industry here to create a source of energy that was green with a zero carbon footprint on set. So. Like I said, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive, so we decided to pick the highest energy consumer of all the trucks on set, which ended up being the craft services trailer. And it's unlike any craft services trailer that has ever been created before. You've got literally an entire restaurant in this truck. So you've got a six burner stove that runs off 124,000 BTUs per hour of hydrogen. You've got high-end commercial freezers coolers. All of our water from our sink system um, acts like a circulatory system on a human. So it actually goes down under the truck, gets filtered, and goes back into our system to provide water to be broken up again into hydrogen and oxygen and continue fueling the truck. We wanted the truck to be able to run in one location for two weeks with the same water. So we ran calculations and that basically put us at about 174 gallons of water. So that's actually stored on top of the truck in four inch diameter tubing. And that 1,348 pounds of water allows us to run the system consistently over a two week period. Theoretically, if you were to be filming, let's say, Seattle, you could actually use rainfall to take it to the next level past two weeks indefinitely. That's correct. One of the things we allocated for, um, the solar panels that actually charge the battery system on the truck um, were configured so that any rainwater that would happen on set would go down into a cistern and fuel those tubes as well and drop into the hydrogen compartment to be broken up. It's really a, a system for almost any environment. We have applications where we're looking at uh, working with several government agencies. Um, we're examining working with the Federal Emergency Management Administration for disaster relief trailers. We're looking at portable tactical power services for the military. Um, we're even looking at examining solutions for the United States Postal Service so that 216,000 postal trucks can be run off hydrogen and they can produce it themselves at 38,000 distribution facilities. Now, will that make the mail come on time or...? Uh, wow, I can't believe you're going to throw me under the bus like that <laughs> on, on film. Uh, under the truck. Yeah, under the <laughs> truck. That's, that's great. So at least they won't have to stop for refueling. Ah, fair enough. There's no reason you literally can't have a high-end hotel room in the middle of nowhere 
off the grid, running off totally natural sources. Do you envision hydrogen cars actually being mass produced? And if so, what will prevent them from going the way of the electric car? I helped work on the prototype, the dashboard for the first electric car for the big three back in 95. It was a different time. It was a different economy. There was a different mindset. I mean, nobody ever heard of anything such as a you know carbon offset. Cars are gonna go one of two different ways, electric or hydrogen. And we hedged our bets on both um, because obviously we can produce electric or hydrogen. The technology has never been an issue. It's the mindset. Uh, people fear change let alone drastic change. If you take a look back when the first transmission lines were being strung, people didn't want poles all over the place, they didn't want wires. Railroads, same thing. People didn't want tracks all over the place. There's a certain level of, of acceptance people have to have with the technology, and that has to be worked in over a certain period of time. Fear and uh, need tend to increase that acceptance of change quite a bit. So when you have a, an oil crisis or an energy crisis or blackouts, people tend to look at things a little differently. And everybody tends to get in the same boat and go the same way, even politicians. President Obama just invested billions of dollars in new nuclear facilities. What do you say to people that insist that the future of energy is something like nuclear instead of what you're working on? That's a good question for a couple generations now, nuclear has been accepted as power that is stable and secure. It is one of the biggest energy producers around. By the time you actually get power coming out of it from flipping the switch, it's 10, 12 years down the road. So the more progress we can accomplish in the meantime with renewable energy and get people to accept that more as a firm source of power, I think you're going to find less of a need for nuclear power plants. You're a very young company, but still you've made incredible progress in a short time. How have you cut through that red tape? We don't look at starting from the bottom up. We don't typically go through the political process from local to regional to national. We wanted to do things that were noticed on a national level or a worldwide level in the first year. Um, that gave us a lot of credibility behind our processes. And it turns out, by going that route, we didn't have to pursue the food chain. They say victory favors the bold. How much has the attitude affected the development of your organization? We like to play what we call here business chess. We tend to make aggressive moves and we tend to support those moves with other pieces. So we'll pursue three different markets that support each other at the same time. So far we've discussed the mobile side of your technology development, but it sounds like the implication is it could be installed in towns, cities, and really drive a new source of electricity, fuel for vehicles. It's no longer the problems in the industry of transporting hydrogen or storing hydrogen because you're literally have the ability to produce it on the fueling station site, any gas station, anywhere. One of the things we wanted to do in creating uh, hydrogen power plants on a utility scale was also try and move things along by conforming with what the Department of Energy wanted to do. Distributed energy is specifically one of the things they wanted to look for in the future. We had a private meeting with U.S. Energy Secretary Stephen Chu. Our transmission grid is failing in the United States. It's the largest machine ever built by man. Millions of miles of electrical cable that was put in a hundred years ago. So if you could create power sources that were more distributed out and localized to the need area, you'd end up pulling a great deal of load off that grid and it could survive for another 50 years while it was being replaced. So for mid-sized cities, you can end up putting a hydrogen power plant to supply specifically that city. The plant can be built within 10 to 12 months, and that city now comes off the grid. How hard do you think it will be for the United States to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energies? Over a thousand products come off raw crude oil. Um, transportation fuels are only one of them. You've got products like plastics, you've got products like esters and solvents and tons of stuff that comes off oil. We're always going to need plastics. It's in everything in our lives. Uh, nylon from shirts to frames for eyeglasses to buttons on jackets, everything. Those products 
we'll find solutions for. You've got corn-based plastics that are being investigated. Our goal is to literally take gasoline and diesel out of the mix because that allows you a longer time period for your oil to be utilized for other products that are important in our everyday lives as those are weaned out as well. There's no way you can eliminate 50 markets at once by taking out plastic, solvents, gasoline, and diesel. The world would probably freak out and collapse. But if we could extend the life of some things and reduce our CO2 footprint um, and stop global warming by not burning all these uh, billions of barrels of oil as gasoline and diesel, you're in a better state of mind. You're in a better health state worldwide your better financial state. I mean, we spent $1 billion a minute in the U.S. last year on oil imports. It's a lot of money. Let's talk about price for a second. Is it something that you see helping the developing world? Absolutely. Um, you got to realize that energy is something that, if you're without it and you're used to it, can literally cause wars. The creation of electric and the creation of an entirely new fuel source for vehicles has a cascade effect and changes entire industries and entire modes of thinking all the way down the line. It's, it's not just the financial industry, it's not just global warming, it's not just CO2 footprints. Desalinization, is this another element that you plan on being a major part of the technology? Yeah, thanks for giving away our business strategy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we tend to plan multiple markets in parallel. So desalination of water was one of the things that we wanted to have the ability to provide on a very cheap level. There are desalination plants that are very, very large. There's one in Tampa, Florida, for example. It's the newest one in the United States. And their progress financially is measured on what is their cost to desalinate one cubic meter of water. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, from the figures I've checked, they can desalinate for approximately 49 cents per cubic meter. Our process can desalinate for six cents per cubic meter and do it far faster. This comes into play in impoverished areas, um, deserts, things of that nature, where you can supply water that's potable much faster, much cheaper. It doesn't take 10 years to put in a thousand acre desalination plant. You're up and running on a one acre site, literally within 24 to 48 hours with a portable unit and you're powering it renewably. Just as with distributed electric power, you now have the ability to provide distributed potable water. If you didn't want to re-add the minerals, you could leave it as distilled water, and now you can produce enough water at a fast rate to irrigate. So now you're literally terraforming areas, areas where you couldn't have sustainable growth of vegetables. You can now irrigate that land and grow vegetables, which now adds to their economy in a localized area. You can literally have economies grow and make money from supplying electric or water to an area. So you've solved the energy crisis, you've solved the water crisis. What's left? Uh, hunger. But I guess typically we could do that by irrigating land and now having enough food. And uh, by the way, ammonium nitrate that's used for fertilizer, the main ingredient to produce it is hydrogen. We're ambitious, but, and maybe a little bit naive. It allows us to vision, uh, to, to think like a child, to have the dreams that you do as a child, of, of changing things, of, of really leaving a mark and doing something good. This is a really, really unusual time. Um, I just turned 40. I've really never in my lifetime seen anything in government or industry or people or politics that have changed so fast that have allowed a greater range of thinking. Um, and it's that thinking that is really drastically altering and allowing um, entire new renewable industries to spring forward. It's, it's the American dream, except now the American dream can be doing something that is good for everyone is financially sound and is healthy for the planet.